If you want to improve at chess, there is one thing you need for certain, and that is good endgame technique and a basic knowledge on how to play the endgame. Uh, when I was a younger player, I didn't like the end game at all. I was, uh, I thought my queen was more important than my opponent's queen, and I gradually realized that to become a an I am and a grandmaster, you have to have basic end game skills, and it's just, well, uh, you have to sit down and learn these things. So today I'm going to show you an ending that is a must-know ending. It's something you will encounter numerous times in your life and knowing what to do will give you many points. So, uh, and by the way, I'm, I was inspired to take exactly this example by this great book that my good friend uh, Carsten Müller sent to me, The Best Endgames of the World Champions. It's a great book and uh, it's also with such a scanning device so you can just use it with your cell phone and on the train or in the bathroom or wherever. So it's a nice book and it's these kind of things to go through uh, games like that, uh, endings like that is what I did to learn uh, sort of the basic of playing the ending. Anyway, uh, today is uh, the Steinis restriction method. It's a very important concept for how to sort of get the knight out of the game. Uh, if you have two bishops against bishop and knight, your main idea is simply to get the knight pushed back, not allow it to have some sort of a strength hold or a place to sit, um, just gradually push it back and it will be a very weak piece. And Steinitz was the first to do this uh, on a sort of a, in a system, systematic way. So let's get into it. This is a famous example. I think it's in a lot of books and rightfully so because it's a good example. Steinitz is black. We are in London and it's 1883. Jack the River time. And this is uh, the Ray Lopez. They also played the Ray Lopez back then. And G6 is also played nowadays. And and this is maybe not the best move uh, because uh, I think Bishop G5 is uh, today. Uh, they will they will do this instead and uh, and have get a slightly better ending. So I don't like the line for black due to this move, but. Uh, it's playable, of course. Uh, I think, I don't know if it's called a Smyslov variation or something. But of course, Steinitz played it in 83, so maybe it should be the Steinitz variation. Bishop E3. And getting the pieces out, they are playing uh, very sort of normal moves. And here comes a little interesting move. 97, kind of cool uh, way to play. Uh, maybe uh, just to leave this one hanging in the air and getting ready for, for d5. I think sometimes in this position you can even go d5 in one go. Anyway, uh, white is not up to the task, so he plays queen d2 and is surprised by this strike in the center, and black is already fine. This bishop here is hanging in thin air, and this guy down here will be strong. There will be no uh, kingside attack. And uh, basically, black is already better, having all the pieces out. Knight here, attacking uh, the bishop here and opening for this move. And white just, and nowadays we know that this is very annoying for, for white, actually, that you have to part with the bishop pair. Uh, back then... This was 83. They didn't know that. And I think Chigorin even preferred the knight to the bishop, which nowadays is considered almost insane. I think it's only Rosenthalis who, who, who likes knights so much that he's, he's giving them more or less equal value. But also he's a specialist in sort of the Capa Blanca uh, chess, where you put all your, your, your pawns on the opposite color of the remaining bishop. We have been through that principle and you can search it in the playlist. Anyway, this is the position we are looking at. Uh, and uh, by the way, here, don't take the pawn. Why not take the pawn? Okay, let's see. The problem is that the knight is better when the structure is 
fragmented. It will easy, have easier f- to, to get some square where it can sit and, and not be harassed by the pawns. So the, the knight is, is vulnerable to rolling pawns coming in a sort of uh, harmonious way towards it. It cannot stop them. But if, if they are like here, disjointed or like like here uh, then it's it's will will sit somewhere and it will not be a problem for instance it's going to even sit here maybe so so don't let the the pawn structure be fragmented like this so just rook a d8 of course a uh, good move just um, and the other rook in here getting all the pieces uh, and white is of course uh, black is of course better here due to the bishop pair but that's all he got he got the bishop pair is that enough to win maybe but it will be against strong players this will not be funny for white uh, this move i'm not sure i like very much um, and here comes a very important thing so what what color should you uh, put your pawns on well it's and this is important this is important when he's got this bishop and a knight you want your pawns on black squares due to this bishop will be extremely strong and it will be able to um, restrict this knight very severely this bishop will not be able to do anything because it will run into a brick of pawns so b6 taking away this square and this square preventing any counterplay if the knight goes here you just go back or maybe you can play c5 actually i'm not sure the knight is very can can go to c6 it's not clear it can go to c6 anyway bishop e6 maybe that's maybe not the best move um c5 i think he, he should maybe have tried bishop d4 i don't know anyway Let's see this instruction. So we already now uh, gotten this. They're already slightly restricted, and this one is strong. And here, what to do? There is a double threat here, and f6. And that looks for, for when I was starting out, I would not like to play a move like f6 because it blocks this diagonal and leaves this bishop passive the thing to understand is that the passive sensitivity is temporary this bishop will come out it will be very strong you just have to be patient and this is sort of the most important thing with the Steinitz restriction method is patient is the key you have time, you can torture your opponent. Often he will self-destruct and you will win without a fight. So just don't rush it and don't push pawns uh, unnecessary. Wait for the right time. Do it gradually and, and it will uh, eventually just win. Bringing the king in, every white realize, okay, I have to put my pawns on white squares and we see that black is continuing his uh, idea with the with these pawns restricting the opponent's uh, pieces he knows that with the te- with with the bishop pair and the space advantage this one is not going to be bad anytime soon but of course you're not going to exchange this one that's very important to know anyway uh, white took here that was very passively played h6 another pawn on black and we see that this is a very strong uh, bishop continuing and what you do is you gradually take space at some point the knight will be able to get some sort of an outpost uh, that would be normal but here f4 actually prevents knight d2 uh, something like this due to to this trick but it will probably at some point get out. The, the, the important thing is to have either won a pawn or uh, gotten such a big space advantage or so much activity that it doesn't matter that a knight get out. The, the, the important thing is not to let it out too soon, not to let it out too soon because then it will 
be able to get, get some counterplay. F4, trying to keep some base, bishop f6, and g3. We also see we're starting to have some weaknesses here, and um, and the pawn here is this also makes this guy really able to roam all over the board. And what to do now? A5, yes, keep on restricting the opponent's pieces, keep on pushing them back, and maybe for some a bit surprising move, a4, that leaves the knight unable to move due to the loss of this pawn. a3, and we see that white is forced into putting all his pawns on the same color as this bishop. This is not his wet dream. This is not the Capablanca way. And look at this bishop. It controls this knight. And by the way, this is uh, often a very uh, important theme in different kind of position that the bishop can dominate the knight. Here uh, white makes a blunder, I think. But it's this move which is is bad uh, and because it, it able enables anyway white black is of course clearly better here and and to the only thing you need to take away from this game is the play up to here that you you gotten a lot of uh, space you pushed him back you're getting active pieces he almost can't move uh, he can't move the bishop then comes rook d2 he can't move the 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 knight, then comes uh, rook e8 or rook d3 or something, and and white has uh, black has many options on how to to strengthen his position, but of course he's looking for maybe some sort of a transformation, and this is also the thing you can usually do when you have the bishop pair. You decide when there's an exchange going on. Uh, it's always the bishop that decides, or not always. Anyway, king f2 was not the best move. And it's for a maybe surprising reason, take. Uh, and the problem for, for white here is, of course, that this move runs into this move, simply losing a rook. So you have to take back with the bishop. And, and this is maybe a little bit counterintuitive. So we got the bishop pair. We gotten him to put all his pawns on black. And now we exchange the black and red bishop. The thing is... The, the, uh, it's again the, the question of good bad bishops uh, protect good pawns and uh, here uh, with the bishop gone this square will be vacant uh, the dominance of this bishop over this knight will be more predominant so this is smart he takes takes and of course white is hoping uh, that and maybe this could be into a free pawn, but it's it's not really going to happen at the moment. Black is uh, is threatening this move with serious problems. And king f6, and here white uh, blunders. He had to play something like rook h1. He's of course clearly worse, uh, but it's not lost. It's not lost yet. I think it might be lost. I think Carsten says it's lost. I'm not sure. But he plays this move, and that loses instantly. Uh, the problem is, and that's something you should always calculate in these kind of endings, always calculate in these kind of endings, is the transposition to another kind of ending. Check. King has to go. Take. King e5. And here we see, and there's a lot of different uh, ways to to exploit a, a space advantage or at an advantage in activity. And often like this, it's not because at, at the moment, uh, if, if it was a pure pawn ending uh, and, and white, black, white was not losing this, he would be almost winning, right? So the, the, the thing is that it's just black to move, uh, white to move, and, and, uh, and the king is coming, and it's coming for the pawn here. 92 and take take and king here and wins 
The thing is, the pawn is is lost. Uh, the the why uh, king is is shielded from going anywhere. He has to try and get to to this square, but f4 and what now? If he goes back, you just take and play king d5, easy. So f3, king e3, and king d3, and the the f pawn queens. So this was William. Wilhelm Steinitz, um, in the best possible way, restricting the knight, uh, transposing into a better ending with the bishop against the knight, and then transposing into knight versus bishop ending, and transposing into a pure one uh, king and pawn ending. So that is technique, and this restriction method with the bishops versus knight and bishop is something you need to learn. You cannot become a, a you for sure cannot become a GM without uh, being able to do this. But also, even I think IM level is 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 far away if you are not able to win such a promising position at least 80% uh, of the time. Anyway, this was GM Talk. I hope you enjoy this video. And if you do, uh, please like and subscribe and tell all your friends and all that things. And uh, hope to see you soon back here on the channel.